Thank you for that warm introduction, Svetlana. Thanks to the Simons Foundation for the opportunity to give this lecture. And thanks especially to all the people who have found time in their busy schedules to listen. I hope it will be interesting. So this title, The Third Pillar of Science, that comes from a Presidential Information Technology Advisory Committee report from 2005. And this slide was actually taken from the presentation that we gave when we were competing for the grant for assignments collaboration on the localization of waves. I'll read the quote. Together with theory and experiment, computational science now constitutes the third pillar of scientific inquiry. Think about that for a, method, a minute, how momentous that is. The scientific method, the idea that experimental observations motivate theory, and then the theory is subject to experimental validation and correction, that paradigm, the scientific method, has been around for at least a millennium, it was formalized in the Renaissance by the likes of Francis Bacon, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton. And it's, it was completely dominant through the late 20th century when it changed and this third pillar was added and computation became a huge partner. This is a tremendous advance because we can do things with computation that we couldn't possibly do with experiment. We can go further away in space and time. We can go to inaccessible scales, places that are impossible to recreate or too dangerous and so forth. So what do I have in mind? Well, you've all seen many examples. Here's a few I've picked out on the internet. The first one is a mundane situation, a golf ball flying through the sky and airflow flying past it, but it's actually probably the most difficult of the six computations I'll show here. This came from the PhD thesis of Clinton Smith and what it's showing you there is uh, the same is the same golf ball at two different speeds. It's going faster in the bottom. And what you're seeing at the higher speed is that the air flowing along the boundary, the so-called boundary layer, becomes turbulent. And that causes it to, it's triggered by the dimples, and that causes it to stick closer to the golf ball, making the trailing wake smaller. And the trailing wake is low pressure. So that means that there's less holding the golf ball back and it goes further. So this computation is one step on the way to making the perfect dimple pattern on a golf ball that optimizes that. That would be something that would be still too difficult to compute to this day. The next picture is a totally different scale. The two little black dots in that picture, let me put on a pointer. The two little black dots in that picture are black holes spir in spiraling towards each other just about to collide. And the yellow and blue are gravitational waves getting cast off by this event, traveling at the speed of light and ultimately being detected in October 2015 as the first detection of gravitational waves by LIGO, Laser Inferential Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's a calculation like this that makes LIGO an observatory. Without it, LIGO would be a gravitational wave detector. But with these computations, we can see what is the physics behind the, the uh, waves that we detected. The third picture is actually one of mine. It comes from our Simons collaboration on the localization of waves. And it shows one of the key objects we study, the hidden landscape function of a random alloy, in this case of Anderson type. This governs the propagation of the quantum waves guiding an electron through a disordered alloy. I won't go through the next three in detail, just quickly. The first one is blood flow through a cardiovascular artery supported by a stent. The next one is trying to create a single photon wave guide. And the last one is the about 17 kilometer cubed area of a cyclonic storm, an updraft in a supercell. So these are all things we can do with modern computation probes that would be almost impossible to do any other way. So I'm very upbeat about computation, as you can see. But let me admit that sometimes there's another attitude. And in fact, if you go back to the Anderson of the Anderson potential, he's really the discoverer of the localization of waves. In his Nobel Prize lecture about localization, he said, to find out almost anything about localization, one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulations to settle even the simplest questions about it. The word indignity, that, that gets to me, it bristles. But it is a sort of popular notion on numerical science. 
It may be useful, but it sure ain't pretty. I hope to convince you that in fact, it, it can be very pretty and a deep and intellectual undertaking with lots of connections to all sorts of mathematics. I thought that this attitude was going away that 1977 things in, for computers were more primitive and so forth, but actually this very week in the obituary for the great mathematician Isidore Singer, the New York Times published this. The study of differential equations is used to describe physical phenomena in the language of calculus, true. Such equations are extremely useful for describing real world situations, true, but they have a problem. No one knows how to solve them precisely, true. Scientists are stuck with approximation. That word stuck again bristles. Okay, what's the basic paradigm? What are we talking about? Well, we start with a physical system, like maybe a golf ball going through the sky and the, the air surrounding it. Now we can't put we can't put that in subject that to mathematical analysis. There's no mathematical theorem that starts let G be a golf ball and let A be the surrounding atmosphere, because those are not mathematical objects. So the first thing you have to do is a mathematical model that converts this to some sort of mathematical system. By a mathematical system, I mean the unknowns that you're trying to determine are continuous functions and fields varying over time and space, like the position and the orientation of the golf ball, the velocity field of the air, the density of the air, the pressure field, and so forth. And they're all tied together with a number of equations, and these are almost always differential equations. Now that's a mathematical object and you can try to prove theorems about it studied qualitatively, but you can almost never solve it exactly as the time said, and you, it's hard to get quantitative information. So that's where we start with the computational science, the discretization comes in. And what you do is you essentially digitize those objects I was talking about. Instead of a continuous field or function, you replace it by a large, a large number of numbers but a finite number of numbers. And you replace the differential equations by a huge system of algebraic equations. So somehow you've taken the mathematical system and replaced it with a collection of 10 billion numbers and 10 billion differential equations tying them all together. That's something which in principle can be put onto a computer. But the job's not over because it's not easy to get a computer to deal with those immense quantities of numbers and do it in an accurate and efficient way so it finishes in a reasonable amount of time and gives you an answer that's worth something. And that's where all sorts of algorithms and codes and design of computers themselves come in to lead to the final numerical solution. Of course, that's a gross simplification, but it gives you an idea what this is about. And basically numerical analysis is the design analysis and validation of the discretization and the algorithms. The validation is the key a key point there, we not only need efficient algorithms, we need ones that are provably give correct answers. Okay, so let's go into that a little deeper. And now I'm not gonna assume much background here. Let me start out by saying, what is a differential equation by giving a toy example? So the toy example is a robotic vehicle that departs starting at 30 miles an hour, but as its battery drains, its speed decreases by a 10th of a mile per hour for each mile of travel. So that's easy to model ma mathematically with this equation. The velocity at time t is 30 minus 1 10th times the position at time t. And then we can ask the physical question like, how far does it go in 10 hours? Now this is an algebraic equation relating two functions, v and x, but they're not independent functions because the position determines the velocity. The, the velocity is just the instantaneous rate of change of position, also known as its derivative. That's what calculus was invented to express. So if we take that definition and plug it into our original algebra equation, we get that the time rate change of position, the derivative of x with respect to t, is 30 minus a tenth times x. That's a differential equation, something that relates one or more functions of time or space or other variables to their instantaneous rates of change. And they break into two big groups, ordinary differential equations, where the time rate of change is with respect to only one variable, as in this case, time, and partial differential equations, which are a much more complex object, 
which allow to, to bring in connect time rates of change with respect to time to also time rates of change with respect to one or more space variables. Now, calculus was in some sense invented to allow formulating and solving differential equations. They appeared at the same time. So in both in Newton's work and in Leibniz's work, way back from 1670s, you'll find the earliest differential equations. Okay, so that's basically the mathematical system in the simplest case. Then the question comes about discretization. So how do you discretize a differential equation? This, this took about a hundred more years to come up and it goes back to the master of us all, Leonard Euler, who made the first method of discretization for differential equations. So there's our ODE and we want to discretize it. So Euler wrote a calculus book and in around 1768, and he put there several ways to solve differential equations, but they were all for very special differential equations. For each particular differential equation of various sorts, he was able to come up with analytical methods. And then he had one method that works for all differential equations, and that's Euler's method of discretization. The idea is to compute what happens over that 10 hour time interval the car is traveling, you break it into short intervals, like you break it into 10 intervals of one hour, and you successively compute the speed at each using the speed at the start of the interval. So if we take the uh, interval and break it into 10 pieces of one hour, the vehicle goes about 30 miles in the first hour because it starts at 30 miles an hour. But after going 30 miles, its speed drops to 27 miles an hour. So in the second hour, it goes about 27 miles, the third hour, 24 and a third miles, and so on and so forth. You do that 10 times, add it up, and you come to the conclusion that it traveled 195.39 miles in the first in the 10 hours. But of course, that's not so accurate because it didn't go the same speed for the entire first hour. It started at 30, but it really was dropping in that time. So you get a more accurate solution by breaking it into 600 minutes. So you do that same computation again, you add up 600 different numbers and you get 189.7 miles an hour. Or you could do it again with seconds, 36,000 seconds, and it doesn't change too much, 189.6 miles. And if you wanted to, you could go to milliseconds. If you have a computer, you can do that. You get 189.63, or you could go to microseconds, and it doesn't change to all eight digits that I've shown there. And so this is what we see happens with Euler method as you take more and more intervals, the numbers settle down, and the final answer is, we hope, the correct answer. And that question was answered by Cauchy. That took another 60 years. Cauchy proved that this method works and always settles down to the correct answer. OK, there's another problem with Euler's method. For this problem to get an answer that was usable, we probably needed to do something like 1,000 intervals, depending on how much accuracy we needed. But for a real problem, instead of this tiny toy problem, we might easily be going to millions or billions of intervals and the arithmetic can get too much even for a computer, not to mention there's round off errors on a computer. So Euler's method is not practical for any realistic problem. After all, it was invented se several hundred years ago. The first, the interesting thing is the first progress, the first real step forward from Euler's method took, took 250 years was due to these gentlemen Carl Runga and Martin Kuta, who they said Euler's method is too slow for real problems because it's only first order accurate. You can show that getting an extra digit of accuracy requires about 10 times as many steps. They invented a method which was a fourth order method and, and it's actually still widely used. I've written on the formula here, but you can ignore it. But roughly it has about four times as much work in every step as Euler's method but it's thousands of times more accurate. And this method is really the go-to method for many engineers even to this day, although we have better things now, of course. So that's a quick, a quick history of the discretization of ODEs, um, now, or a quick introduction to it. Now let me talk a little bit about PDEs. So the scientific problem I'm gonna discuss is one that was very important to the development of PDEs, a vibrating string, think a guitar string, and it vibrates and emits a tone. And it was observed already by the Pythagoreans 
that if you took two similar strings and their lengths were in simple integer proportions, one to two or two to three, you got harmonious sounds. And that was part of the canon studied for a millennium. It wasn't really begun to be explained until the beginning of the 18th century when Yosef Savour began to do experiments with harpsichord strings. And then Brooke Taylor carried that further and did the first theoretical room results and derived the shapes of the fundamental mode and the other normal modes of a string. So what he, uh, Taylor proved was that if you take a string like this one here, and you have to realize that I've magnified the vertical direction by a factor of a thousand. So this is a string that's maybe a meter long and vibrating a millimeter in amplitude. That the shape it'll take will be a multiple of the sine function, sinusoidal, which is the picture that I've drawn there. And it'll depend on the length of the string. And then it'll oscillate like this up and down with a frequency that uh, depends on the tension and the density of the string, but is inversely proportional to the length of the string. So if you cut the length in half, the frequency will double and you'll get the tone an octave higher. And he also studied the higher modes, the overtones of the strings. And he found that the second mode is exactly the octave going twice as fast and the third mode three times as fast and so forth. But that's not the whole story for vibrating strings. And that was uh, studied by uh, Jean-Laurent d'Alembert in the next several decades. D'Alembert noticed or realized that a string could easily take shapes that were not normal modes. For instance, if you take a harpsichord string and you pluck it with a quill, you get this triangular shape, which is not one of the normal modes. Or if you take a piano hammer and hit a string, it'll move into start out by not moving into a normal mode. So D'Alembert said, what is the general shape? If I give an initial shape of a harpsichord, of a taut string, an initial velocity, what vibrations does it undergo? And he wrote down this partial differential equation. So this is the first partial differential equation that was introduced to science, modeling the one-dimensional taut string. It's called the one-dimensional wave equation or the D'Alembertian after D'Alembert. Um, and unlike most of the PDEs we'll see, it actually can be solved exactly analytically without a computer. And D'Alembert did that. He found the general solution to this PDE and he found what happened is every string, depending on its density and tension, has a natural speed. I call it C here. And a solution to this equation is any traveling wave traveling without change of shape to the left or to the right with speed C and any superposition of those. And those are the only solutions. And that might seem a little surprising because uh, Taylor had already proved that it's, there are standing wave solutions, which are not moving left or right. And the solution to that is explained by this uh, animation. On the top, you have a high wavelength sinusoid, orange traveling left, blue traveling right, and green is their sum. And if you pay attention to the green one, you see it's a standing wave. So superimposing traveling waves give standing waves. And on the bottom, there are different traveling waves with the same speed, and their superposition gives a standing wave with twice the frequency. After that first PDE, over the next several hundred years, continuing to the present day, physicists and scientists and mathematical modelers have developed many, many PDEs to cover all aspects of fundamental physics, wave motion, fluid flow, gravitation, mechanics, heat flow, et cetera, et cetera. I've written down just a tiny sampling of the important differential equations of science. And the most fundamental, very often we'll have a situation that will involve several of these and they'll be coupled together and have modifications. And I've left out famous ones like uh, in kinetic theory, the Boltzmann equation or in gauge theory, the Yang-Mills equation and so forth. Um, but that's those are the the things that drive the mathematical models that we study today. Okay. What about um, what about discretization of a PDE? Well, let me take a situation 
which is near and dear to our, the hearts of the, us Minnesotans, which is the cabin in the North Woods. So here's a floor plan. I've assumed that the outside temperature is zero degrees and it's zero along the walls, except where there's a radiator of 60 degrees and the larger radiator of 35 degrees. And I've imagined we've allowed the temperature to settle down to a steady state and we wanna know the temperature at a given point X. So the way you solve this, uh, discretize this is you write down the PDE, which is this one. It's uh, the Laplace equation. Uh, it can be obtained by conservation of energy and Newton's law of heat flow. And then you take the room and you cut it into a grid. So I cut it into a bunch of little squares. You could imagine in the middle of each of these squares is a little grid point. So I have a 20 by 20 grid on my domain. And I want to assign a temperature to each of the squares or to each of the grid points. For that, I discretize the Laplace equation using this picture here to get the Laplacian at X. I can write a formula that depends on the value of the temperature at X and of the neighbors to the west and east and to the north and south in this combination. That's an approximate Laplacian, a second order approximation to the Laplacian. I set that equal to zero and I get an algebraic equation for the values of these gray boxes. So for example, if I only had four gray boxes, I had these temperatures on the edge. This equation would tell me to give a number to each gray box such that each box is the average of its four neighbors. And there's only one solution to that, the numbers I put there. 14 is the average of 48 and four and four and zero and so forth. I do that with 20 by 20, I get the temperature profile in the room. If I wanted more accurately, just like Euler's method, I decrease, increase the number of intervals. So I increase the number of boxes to 100 by 100 and I get a nice heat profile. And we learn what every Minnesotan knows, which is you wanna to get to the cabin early so you can get a seat near the radiator or you're gonna freeze your butt. That's called the finite difference method. And that goes all the way back to Brooke Taylor in the 18th century. But there's a newer method that uh, grew up basically in the 1960s and 70s called the finite element method. And I wanna describe that as well. Um, it's easy to, to explain for a PD that has a variational formulation, and I'll do the minimal surface equation. I didn't write down the PDE here, but rather it's variational formulation, which is that its solution is the minimizer of this quantity here. That's saying you're looking for a function defined on this tan square whose graph goes through the brown curves, but has minimal area, very much like you're looking for the shape a soap bubble makes because it's the minimal surface connecting the, the two sides of the frame. So in the finite element method, what you do is you cut up the domain into a bunch of little triangles. They don't have to be in an orderly fashion, it's arbitrary. And then you consider functions whose graph over each triangle is linear, has a planar graph. And you minimize over that and you would get something like this and you do it with a much finer triangulation and you get the minimal surface with some accuracy. So that's the basic idea of the finite element method. Let me look at how much progress has been made with these methods over the past years. The first scientific computation using a digital computer was made by Charney, Fjortov, and von Neumann. That's reasonable because von Neumann was basically the inventor of the stored program digital computer or one of them. And they used this computer to do a weather prediction. And this is from their paper in 1950. It shows that they could only afford to have a grid on their ENIAC computer that had 270 grid points. So they were looking for 270 unknown values. To do a 24 hour weather forecast, they could only afford to take time steps of three hours. So there was eight time steps. And that took their computer nearly 24 hours. So they could barely keep up with the weather and they missed a hurricane in the result. So it wasn't a great success, but it was a great trailblazer indicating the direction to go further. By the way, von Neumann is maybe the first person to suffer from the terms like the indignity of computation. When he built his computer in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, the faculty didn't really want it, even though he had the grant funds to pay for it. And they relegated it to a room in the basement next to the toilets. And as soon as he died, they disassembled it. Now, let me compare that computation with a recent one by Stowell, Fassenfest, and White from Los um, 
from Los Alamos National Labs. Uh, this is an investigation of radar passing through a building and it uses finite elements, use 10 billion finite elements, 10 billion of those little triangles, although in this case, they're little boxes. Uh, and they use 12,000 time steps. So that's not uh, 12,000 time steps. There's multiple unknowns, six unknowns. So it's 60 billion unknowns, 12,000 time steps, about a trillion times bigger than what von Neumann did in the 50s. And you can ask that's remarkable. How many things are a trillion times better? Why did that, how did that come about that we can do so much more uh, with the passage of time? And this is a graph to explain why. You might think that the credit is due to the computer technology from the ENIAC to the present day. And of course that is a big piece of it. That follows more or less Moore's law. Here I look at 40 years from about 1960s to early 2000s. And Moore's law indicates a speed up of about a factor of 10 to the eighth in that time for solving a very big science problem with a billion unknowns. If you look at the algorithms that are used, those algorithms that were the third part of the paradigm of scientific computation, those have gotten better and better about every 10 years there's been a breakthrough and they're plotted here. And the improvement of algorithms when applied to a pro problem of this size are responsible for about a speed up of 10 to the 12th actually dwarfing what the computers do. And we get to benefit from both those increases. And so we've had a speed up of almost 10 to the 20th in, theoretically in this uh, case. So again, that's very upbeat, but let me point out sometimes things go wrong. So the next three slides are gonna indicate what happens when things go wrong. This is a real world example. August, 1991, Gansfjord, Stavanger, Norway. They're trying to build this Sleipner A offshore oil platform. In order to put the foundation on the seafloor, what they do is they build this concrete foundation filled with air so it floats, float it out to the right place in the fjord and slowly, slowly, slowly fill it up with water so it sinks centimeter by centimeter down to the seabed. What happened is the hydrostatic pressure that was induced in the tanks caused uh, deformation, especially this little piece here, caused it to crack and the whole thing uh, demolished itself under the hydrostatic pressure and crashed down to the seafloor at a cost of $700 million and the cause of a small earthquake. So why did this happen? Don't they test these things? Well, of course they do. They had done numerical computation with the industry leading software of the day, finite element software called Nastran and it underestimated the shear stress by 47%. Later, people did better finite element discretization as they investigated what went on. And they saw if they had done it right from the beginning, they could have predicted that uh, cracking at 65 meters within a meter or two. So we'll talk a little bit more about what happened to this one later if, we, if somebody asked me during the questions anyway. Let me take a more a simple minded example of something going wrong. This is back to our vibrating string. Remember it's magnified a thousand times in the vertical direction. And here I take the string and I compute what solution will happen with this initial condition. And we get that nice thing, which we know is the superposition of uh, traveling waves in two directions. And that's an accurate computation. Now I change the density on the string or I change the tension on the string, make it a little higher so this, wave speed is a little faster and I do it again. And I get instead of that picture, this picture. Looks about the same till now. And then it goes absolutely crazy. So what happens that one string, it does this, which is quite accurate and the other string, it's totally wrong. Well, that was studied by Courant, Friedrichs and Levy in 1928. It's well understood. It's the notion of instability. I won't explain it now, but let me explain instability in a simpler case. Let me see how I'm doing on time here. Okay, I better move along. So the simpler case I'm talking about is not a differential equation, but just computing an integral like this, the integral x to the n minus one e to the x minus one for n equals 15. To solve it, one thing I could do is integrate by parts. And even if you don't know much about calculus, you can see this recursion relation, gamma n plus one is one minus n gamma n. Simple formula, if you know gamma one, you can figure out gamma two and then gamma three and so forth. And gamma one is known exactly by calculus 
as 0.632121 dot, dot, dot. So I take that value, 0.632121. I take one minus one gamma one, that gives me gamma two. One minus two gamma two gives me gamma three and so forth. And I get these numbers. Looks reasonable because these are supposed to be positive numbers going down towards zero. Then I do it again. I get 0.14 and so forth. And I go, looks reasonable till the 10th one when all of a sudden it goes a little negative, which it shouldn't, but let's be hopeful and keep going. I keep going and it goes absolutely crazy. So I get as my answer 38,000 when I know the answer is really a number between zero and one. So what went wrong here? This, I didn't make any mistakes here. Well, I made one tiny mistake. I didn't put in the exact gamma one. I cut it off after six decimal places and ignored the dot, dot, dot. That's the only thing I did wrong. Otherwise, th this would be mathematically guaranteed to give the exact solution at the end. This is the essence of instability. You make a tiny mistake in your input data and it leads to a huge error in your output. That's called instability. And it shows you how difficult it is to be a computational scientist. Imagine you're doing billions of numerical operations. You have to make sure you don't do 15 of them that behave like this one because they can destroy everything. That's instability. And I'll end this section with talking about the fundamental theorem in numerical analysis, which ties these concepts together. So let's go back to a situation that could be a differential equation. LU equals F. The data is some function F or some F in some space Y, could be a space of functions. And then LU is some operation on the unknown U, the unknown in a space X. And then L could be say a differential operator and we want to solve LU equals F for U. So we discretize means we replace the space X and the space Y with finite dimensional spaces, XH and YH. We replace the operator L with some finite dimensional invertible operator LH from XH to YH. We replace F the data with some data in the discrete data that's supposed to be nearby FH and YH. And we solve LH UH equals FH. That's our discretization. How do we tell if that works or not? Well, we measure the error by the difference between the true solution U and the discrete solution UH, but since they're in different spaces, that doesn't quite work. So what I do is I put, I take a representative of the true solution U in the discrete space. Like if the discrete space is a space of grid functions, I restrict U to the grid. That's called the error. I measure it in a norm in the space XH, and I want that to be small. And it methods called convergent if that tends to zero as I refine our grid. The consistency error I got by taking the difference between LH on the exact solution minus FH, how much the true solution fails to satisfy the discrete method measured in the YH norm. That's the consistency error. Consistency means that goes to zero. And stability is the sensitivity of the discrete problem, how much a small change in Y in FH leads to a change in UH. That's called the stability and the stability constant. And stability means the stability constant remains bounded. And the basic error estimate, which is not hard to prove, is that the error is bounded by the product of the stability constant and the consistency error. And from that, it follows that a discretization, which is both consistent and stable, is convergent. So the conclusion is simple. You have to make your discretization is both consistent and stable. What's not simple is actually to achieve that because there are many different subtle ways in which inconsistencies and instabilities can creep in. Kuran, Friedrichs, and Levy discovered one of them. So here's a quiz and I'll give you the answer in the question period. Was the Sleipner A failure, was that due to inconsistency or instability? You know it must be one or the other. Okay. That brings me to, that's the first half of my talk. And that was very historical and was focused on the fundamental ideas. Now I wanna focus in on a specific trend in recent numerical analysis, one of a number of them, but one that's been very important and has allowed some big advances in what kind of problems we can solve accurately from just a short time ago. First, I'll discuss a case of ODEs where it's easiest to understand. And then I'll go to PDEs where structure preserving discretization is one of my own research interests. So structure preserving discretizations 
are numerical methods which preserve on the discrete level key geometric, topological, and algebraic structures possessed by the original continuous system. And the example I'll discuss for ODs is a symplectic integrators for Hamiltonian problems. So the Kepler problem is such a problem. It has two unknowns. The Kepler problem is the find the orbit of a planet around a, a much more massive body around the sun. And we know, of course, since the time of Kepler that the answer is an elliptical orbit. And the unknowns are the position vector of the planet. We'll say the sun is at the origin, so we'll call that Q. And the, and the velocity vector of the planet P, which is just the time derivative of the position vector. And the time derivative of velocity is acceleration. And by uh, Newton's second law and the Newtonian law of gravity, the inverse square law, that's minus Q over Q cubed. So suppose I solve these ODEs using Euler's method to compute four orbits and I use plenty of time steps, 200,000. The planet goes along here and follows the red trajectory, which is accurate for about two orbits, and then deviates away from the true orbit. And by the time we get to four orbits, it's nowhere in the right position and nowhere near back to where it started. Here's, here I wrote down what Euler's method is. It's just formed this difference operator for the two differential equations and set the derivative approximate derivative of Q to Pn and the approximate derivative of P to Qn over Qn cubed. Suppose I make the tiniest change to this method. After I've computed Qn plus one from the first equation, I use it in the second equation. So I change those ends on the right-hand side here to Qn plus one. That's something invented by de Vogelaire in 56 called the symplectic Euler method. I do the same thing. I go four orbits and you see it's almost perfect. You can't see the difference between the two orbits. So it's remarkable. It's like magic. You make that slight, slight change. It didn't change the consistency error. It's still order h, but it changed the stability properties quite a lot. If you use a higher order method like the classical four stage Runge Kutta method, the same thing happens. It's a complete failure for the classical Runge Kutta method, but there's another four stage fourth order method that'll give you perfect answers because it's something called symplectic. I put down some of the key references here and there's this excellent textbook by uh, Hera, Lubitsch and Wanner on the subject. So let me go to a real problem that was pub uh, published in 2009 by Jacques Lotzkar and Mikhail Gastineau of the Paris Observatory. They used symplectic integration to simulate the evolution not of one planet, but of the entire solar system and not for four orbits, but for 5 billion years. And they asked the question, was the solar, solar system stable till that time, or will there be a collision of planets or perhaps a planet object, ejected from the solar system? Now that's difficult to answer because that 5 billion years is so long that a difference of a millimeter in the position of planet today could change the answer to that question. So what they did is they solved the problem 2,500 times changing the initial data by a half a millimeter each time. And here they plot all 2,500 solutions they found. And these ones that shoot up, which is about 1% of the solutions are the ones that lead to collisions. So they found there's a 99% chance that our solar system will survive 5 billion years. But the question I wanna ask is how could they compute for 5 billion years when a decent method like Runge Kata 4 has trouble going for a few hundred uh, orbits? of a single planet. So I don't have too much time to talk about this. So let me just say this part will be designed for people who know something about phase space of, of ordinary differential equations. If you take the unknowns of the ordinary differential equations, they divide in two groups, the Q position ones and the P velocity ones, and you plot P versus Q. So here's a PQ plane. And each little dot, like this dot here, is the position, of, the position of velocity at one particular instant of one particular arrangement. You let time run and that position of velocity changes and maybe moves to the blue point over here. You do that for different points, you get different, uh, you get different points over here. And if you do it for a whole region of points, you get a different region over here. But let me show that in a specific example, simpler example than the Kepler problem just a pendulum, which is described by its angle and its angular velocity, two scalars. Here I've plotted P versus Q. And so this dot 
is a pendulum with angle zero just hanging down and velocity zero, just a pendulum hanging at the bottom. This dot here is a pendulum that's gone up to angle pi. So it means it's, it's standing straight up with velocity zero. This one is a pendulum with angle of 90 degrees and vo velocity zero. And this one will move along this circle till it falls down and then continue and go 90 degrees the other way and then come back. That's what these orbits show. So suppose we take some different initial conditions and I take a region of initial conditions in green, a different one in red, a different one in pink. And I let them flow forward in time through the pendulum equations. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And what you see is they get very distorted, but the area doesn't change. The area of the distorted region is the same as the area of the original region. That's what Hamiltonian systems do, and that's called symplecticity. And the structure preserving discretization of symplectic method has that same property for the discretization. Discretization is symplectic if the discrete flow map that takes you from time step n to time step n plus one preserves area in that way. Not approximately, not to when the step size is small, but exactly. That's a symplectic method. And in many situations, symplectic methods can be proven to imply good stability properties and uh, therefore allow much longer, much more accurate computations than would a non symplectic method. How do you find symplectic methods and how do you prove that they have these properties? Well, that's a lot of very deep mathematics. So let's go back to uh, the Lescar Gastineau calculation. How did they pull it off? They used a method called Saba 4 that was derived in 1995 by McLaughlin. It uses very fancy mathematics to generate it. The key property it has is it's symplectic. So it has excellent stability properties. It has some other structure preserving properties. They did a time step of nine days. So they had to do 200 billion time steps to get 5 billion years. And surprisingly, their method was only second order. But that was the other trick of Saba 4. The Saba 4 developers, McLaughlin, realized that the nine, the nine body problem or the 10 body problem for the solar system is very much like 10 uncoupled Kepler systems because the interplanetary attraction is very small compared to the solar planet attraction because the planetary mass is only a thousandth of the solar mass. So the consistency error is not really order h squared. It's order h squared times that epsilon squared, which is a millionth of an order h squared. And that made it much more accurate. So long story short, they had a clever trick to improve the consistency, a, a very clever trick structure preserving discretization to improve the stability. And that's what allowed that computation. OK. And with the final part of the talk, I want to talk about structure preserving discretizations of PDEs, something called finite element exterior calculus, which is my baby. Svetlana mentioned I gave a plenary talk at the ICM in 2002. I sort of introduced this subject to the world then, although it didn't have a name at that point. And I got to work with two collaborators, Rick Falk and Ragnar Winter, and we and we int introduced the real theory in a 150 page paper in Acta Numerica in 2006. And the second part of it came out in the bulletin of the AMS in 2010. And there's now one book length uh, treatment of it, this book that uh, Siam published in 2018. And this is actually, if you're from this mathematical training, is a fairly accessible and relatively short book if you want to get an idea of the subject. But let me just say a little bit to give you some impression. So the structure which is preserved in FIC is captured by what's called a Hilbert complex and its resulting cohomology and Hodge theory. I'll explain those words a little bit. And so the idea is that FIC designs discretizations that reproduces those structures at the discrete level and in that way achieves stable, consistent and so, so convergent methods. Oh, and I see I'm, I've been a little bit off in my uh, slides. I probably should have had this slide showing while I was speaking. Sorry about that. Um, so that's a picture of the book and those are the dates that I mentioned. So let me give you an example. To give you an example, I'm gonna start out with a, an example of finite elements that does not need FIC, remind you how finite elements work. And then I'll show you a example where FIC is necessary. 
I should point out that that 10 billion element calculation that I showed with the radar past the building, that uses FIC style elements and wouldn't have been possible without them. And another um, major piece of software that uses FIC is the program called LFRIC, which is the main climate weather modeler being used by the British Meteorology Office. They redid their software in about two years ago, and there's now FIC based. And there are many uh, other software systems that are including this kind of thing. Okay, so let's look at a finite element problem that doesn't need FIC. Finding the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, or if you want a physical example, the normal modes of the drum, something considered already by Euler. This has a variational formulation. You're minimizing the integral of the norm of the gradient of u squared, the sum of the squares of the partial derivatives, du dx and du dy, subject to u being zero on the boundary and having integral squared one. So remember what we do in finite elements, we cut the domain into a lot of triangles, probably many more triangles than shown here. And we restrict our attention to functions which are piecewise linear on each triangle or maybe piecewise polynomial of higher degree or something like that. And then we do the minimization and here's what we get. Here are the outlines. The fundamental mode of a drum is this first one, which is large in this corner and almost zero in the opposite corner. This is computed with 4,000 piecewise linear elements and the energy it gives, the value of this minimum is 9.279. That's the next mode and its energy and so forth. And those are quite accurate. If we wanted them more accurate, we would take more triangles or higher degree polynomials or both. Here's both, 16,000 triangles, fourth degree polynomials. And the numbers have now settled down to 9.19, 11.166 and so forth. So that works great. Now let me show you an example that doesn't work as great. The problem is the normal modes again, but this time of an electromagnetic cavity. So this is called Maxwell's eigenvalue problem. We have to minimize an integral of first derivatives of the electric field. The electric field is a vector and the quantity we have to minimize is the L2 norm of the curl, the curl integral of the curl squared, subject to uh, boundary con conditions and uh, normalization. I did it on an ordinary square this time because in that case, the exact solution can be figured out analytically. And it's just the sum of the squares of positive integers. So here, what I've done is I've done the calculation using 16 triangles, 64 triangles, up to 4,000 triangles. And I got the first normal mode energy and the second fundamental mode energy and so forth. And you see the first ones are converging. They're clearly converging to two. So that's good, two is one plus one. The next two are each converging to five. There's two of them because we could have one plus four or four plus one. The next ones are clearly converging to six. And that's bad because as long as you think about it, you won't be able to write six as m squared plus n squared. That's a wrong answer. This one doesn't exist. The numerics show it, but it's wrong. The, last, the next ones are correct. And then the last one is 15, which again is totally spurious eigenvalue. So this is a true disaster for computations because if you're designing a device on the base of this and you see these numbers, you see them nicely settling down, you probably think it's correct, but it's not. In this case, the problem is the method is unstable. It's hard to see why, but it is unstable. That's something that Feek explained. And if you use different elements, not piecewise linear, not piecewise polynomials of degree four, but more sophisticated elements that come out of Feek, you get the right answer with no spurious eigenvalues. So why is this? Well, I can only give you a hint of why this is. And to do this, I go back to Maxwell and Maxwell's equations. So these are Maxwell's equations. They involve that electric field vector and the, its curl. They also involve the magnetic field vector B and its divergence and some other terms. They also involve scalar quantities like the charge density rho. And these are the, the most popular differential equations for making t-shirts, I believe. But they're also useful for describing almost every kind of electromagnetic phenomenon. And Maxwell himself had the brilliant realization that the vectors that occurred in it, the E and the B, were different kinds of vectors. He wrote, physical vector quantities can be divided into two classes, in one of which the quantity is defined with reference to a line, while in the other, the quantity is defined with reference to an area. So that was in 1891. That was made precise 
in the theory of differential forms developed by Eli Cartan in 1899. And so let me try to explain what a differential form is. It's something defined on a domain. Maybe it was all of three dimensional space or this blob with three holes in it. And they could be two dimensional or one dimensional or three dimensional or, or, or higher, n dimensional. You have in three dimensions, you have four kinds of differential forms, zero forms, one forms, two forms, and three forms, which I denote by lambda three of omega is those three form differential forms on omega. In n dimensions, you'd have up to n forms. And the zero forms and the three forms can be viewed as scalars, while the one forms and two forms can be viewed as vectors. And this is what Maxwell meant. There's two kinds of vectors. The electric field is a one form. The magnetic field is a two form. What can you do with a magnetic field? Well, a k-dimensional, a k-form has a natural way to be integrated over a k-dimensional su subsurface in the domain. So that's saying that a zero form can be integrated over a point. That means a zero form can be evaluated at a point like a temperature is evaluated at a point or electric potential is evaluated at a point. A one form is evaluated over a curve, a line. That would be the electric field because how do you measure an electric field? You can't measure an electric field at one point. What you do is you take a charge, you move it over a little distance and that gives you the integral of the electric field over that little piece of curve. That's how you measure it. Temperature gradient is something similar. You can't tell if you're in temperature gradient by measuring at one point, but you move a little distance in a temperature gradient and you see the temperature change. That tells you that the temperature, that you're in a gradient, positive gradient. A two form is also a vector, but it's different. It's like the magnetic field you see with these magnetic filings. The way you would measure this magnetic field, you'd put a little piece of surface and see how many of the field lines cross it. Where the field is strong is where the field lines are densely packed and many would cross a piece of surface. That's a two form. A density like mass density is a three form. You can't measure density at a single point or on a surface. You have to take a little volume, see how much it weighs, and then you get the density in that little volume. That's the differential form and its integral. The derivative of a differential K form is defined for every K and it gives you a differential K plus one form. And all these operators, grad curl and div, that you see in mathematical physics, those are all different cases of the, this natural derivative of differential forms. And there's a vast extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus relating these two things. It says that the, deriv that the derivative of a differential k minus one form is a differential k form in the null space of VK. In other words, its derivative is zero. That's what mathematicians would say, exact forms are closed. Physicists would say conservative fields are irrotational. That's really this range is contained in the null space. And that creates something called a complex called the Duram complex, which is this uh, structure where you have all the differential forms, zero forms through n forms connected by their exterior derivatives and two in a row giving you zero. That allows you to define something called cohomology, which measures the difference between the range of one D and the null space of the next D. And what Hodge theory is, is a clever way to use functional analysis together with cohomology to actually compute the cohomology groups by solving differential equations, which are some kind of differential, some kind of uh, generalization of the Laplace equation. And these cohomology groups turn out to be fundamental topological invariants. So what I'm showing here is a differential one form that's harmonic, that satisfies Laplacian equals zero. And it exists only because there's a hole in this domain. I wouldn't be able to create this one without a hole. And the fact that there's just one of these on this domain tells me this domain has a hole. That can be figured out by measuring the, the first cohomology group of this domain. Here's a similar thing using a sphere. I'm only showing half the sphere. This is showing the two form, which is harmonic. I won't get into it. Okay, now the finite element exterior calculus takes fancy structure like that, that we were just talking about and creates it also on the discrete level. It says, if you're now gonna use finite element spaces with triangulations to, to give discrete differential forms, they have to form a complex themselves. And what's more, there has to be a relationship between these two complexes 
that's related by these pi operators. For people in the know, there have to be commuting projection operators from the first complex, the Duram complex, to the discrete Duram complex. And there's a theory that, among other things, says that if these hypotheses happen, then the cohomology is preserved. And if you use these kind of spaces, spaces that satisfy those hypotheses, the finite, for finite elements, you get consistence and stability, and so convergence. And then to close, the, the last question would be, how do you actually find spaces of finite elements, spaces of discrete differential forms that satisfy those hypotheses, which are quite abstract? And the num number of different tools from different parts of mathematics that's been used to this is quite impressive, I think. These are different branches of mathematics that have entered into creating such differential, discrete differential forms, some of the tools used from those things. This is what one of these kind of new kind of finite elements looks like. I won't go into exactly what it defines. And for the question of differential forms, this has now been settled completely. We know which are the right finite elements to use for differential forms. There's other kind of equations that lead to other kind of complexes that this is still an open question for. And there's a lot of work going on. But for differential forms, in fact, we made a periodic table, which is this thing. I made this together with Anders Log, and it was mailed by Siam to their entire membership. These show in the first three rows, the discrete differential forms of in one dimension, in the second three rows in two dimensions, in the third three rows in three dimensions that could keep going. The three rows are polynomials of degree or consistency error of order one, order two, order three, and that could have kept going. The four different segments are different families of finite elements. And uh, within each one, we have zero forms, one forms, and two forms in 2D, zero, one, two, three forms in 3D, and so forth. This is all done completely systematically, and it basically gives the correct mathematical things to use as finite element differential forms. With that, I'll put up the concluding remarks. I think I'll let you read them yourselves, and I thank you for your attention and look forward to the question period. Mm -hmm.